Hello. In this lecture, we'll cover the law of sines and the law of cosines. We'll begin with the discussion of solving right triangles. Solving a triangle refers to finding all of the angles and all of the sides. Solving right triangles boils down to basic trigonometry, inverse trigonometry, and the Pythagorean theorem. For general triangles that are not right triangles, we will need to introduce the law of sines and the law of cosines. We will work through several examples, but we will conclude with a few warnings regarding unsolvable or ambiguous cases where you need to be careful in applying these two laws. Solving a triangle means to find all of the lengths of the sides as well as all three angular measures. For a right triangle, you can solve the triangle as long as you know either one side length and one of the non-right angles or two side lengths. For example, look at the following triangle. We wish to solve this triangle, in other words, find the unknown length A, the unknown hypotenuse C, and the unknown angle, capital A. It is convention, by the way, for capital letters to refer to angles across from lowercase letters, which are their sides. Observe that the angle capital A is across from side A. Now, the angle is easy to find to begin with. Since we were given one of the non-right angles, and we know a right angle is 90 degrees, also the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees, we find that this unknown angle A must be 70 degrees. Next, we can use trigonometry. For example, the sine of 20 degrees is the opposite length 5 divided by the hypotenuse, which is the unknown C. We can solve this for C. So C, the hypotenuse, must be 5 divided by the sine of 20 degrees. Punching this into a calculator is approximately 14.62. Similarly, the tangent of 20 degrees will be 5 divided by A, opposite over adjacent. Therefore, we can solve for A and discover that A is approximately 13.74. Let's solve this triangle. So here, we are not given any angle other than the right angle, but we are given two different sides. So therefore, we can find the third side thanks to the Pythagorean theorem. The length 8.25 squared plus the unknown b squared must equal the hypotenuse of 9.17 squared. We can solve this for the unknown length b. Now, theoretically, b would be plus or minus this square root, but because it is a length in a triangle, we choose the positive square root, and this was constructed to give us 4. Now that we know all three sides of the triangle, as well as one angle, we can find the missing angles. So let's find the missing angles A and B when we already know the three sides of this right triangle. We're going to be using inverse trigonometric functions. For example, for the angle B, we might take the sine of this angle. The sine of B will be the opposite length 4 divided by the hypotenuse 9.17. Alternately, we could take the tangent of b and express it as the opposite length 4 divided by the adjacent length 8.25. We could even take the cosine of b and express it as the adjacent length 8.25 divided by the hypotenuse 9.17. Any of these will be valid. Here, we could say that b must be the arc sine of 4 over 9.17. That's 25.9 degrees or the arc tangent of 4 divided by 8.25, or the arc cosine of 8.25 divided by 9.17. In all three cases, we get the same answer. Any one of them would be correct. You can pick whichever one you want. Therefore, the missing angle A, we don't actually have to go through all this work because we have found the angle B, and we know that A and B together must add up to 90 degrees, we can solve that A must be 64.1 degrees. We saw in the previous examples that right triangles can be solved using trigonometric functions and inverse trigonometric functions, also the Pythagorean theorem. Now, in general, if you have a non-right triangle, we can use what are called the law of sines and the law of cosines to solve triangles. The law of sines states that if we have a general triangle and note that the angles A, B, and C are capital letters, they are across from sides labeled A, B, and C with lowercase letters. Angle A is across from side A and so forth. This is convention. So in any triangle, the sine of angle A divided by the length of side A will be the same number as if you had taken the sine of angle B and divided by length B, 
and you'll get the same number if you took the sine of angle C and divided by length C. Between different triangles, these quantities will be different, but in any one triangle, these ratios will all give you the same number. So here at the top, we see a restatement of the law of sines. Let's use it to solve this triangle. Observe that we are given two angles, 80 degrees and 24 degrees, and one side length, which is in between them, of six. This is an angle-side-angle -angle congruence of a triangle. We have two angles and the side between them. The first thing to bear in mind is that in a triangle, if you know two angles, you really know all three, and you can get that information quite quickly. So since all three angles of the triangle must add up to 180 degrees, we compute that the missing angle C is 76 degrees. Now we can start finding some side lengths using the law of sines. Let's look at side length A. The sine of angle A, which was 24 degrees, divided by length A, must be the same as the sine of angle C, which we've computed to be 76 degrees, divided by the length across from it, which is 6. Note that the only unknown here is length A. So cross multiply and divide by sine of 76 degrees to get that the length A must be 6 times the sine of 24 degrees divided by the sine of 76 degrees, which is approximately 2.52. What about length B? Now we can set up that the sine of the angle across from that length, which was 80 degrees, divided by that missing length of B, must also equal the sine of 76 degrees divided by 6, sine of C over little c. You can cross multiply and solve for B and get approximately 6.09. Note here that what's very handy to have is both one angle and the length across from it. So if you have two angles, you can automatically find the third, and then whatever one side you have, is across now from a known angle. So very loosely speaking, the law of sines, which we just covered, is most useful when you know all the angles of a triangle and just one side. But there's also something called the law of cosines. So here we have our general triangle, angles ABC with sides across from them. Then a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared minus two times bc times the cosine of a. But you also have that b squared is a squared plus c squared minus 2ac times the cosine of b, and c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab times the cosine of c. Observe how similar these all look to the Pythagorean theorem, where one side length squared is equal to the sum of the other two. In fact, if you have a 90 degree angle, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero and that cosine term would vanish. So this is sometimes called a generalized Pythagorean theorem, the law of cosines. All three of these equations are true in any triangle. So let's use the law of cosines to solve this triangle here. In contrast to the examples with law of sines, observe now that we have lots of information about side lengths. The sides are of length 7, 10, and 12, but we have no information at all about angles. Broadly speaking, the law of cosines is more useful when you need to find angles and you have information about sides. That's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a sort of general rule of thumb. So now, the side length A we'll call 10, B is 12, and C is 7. Okay, we're labeling them as such because they go across from the angles with the same letter. So across from angle capital A, we're calling that side length little a and so forth. So for angle A, we're going to use the version of the law of cosines that involves angle A. That was a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc times the cosine of capital A. Now we know little a, little b, and little c, the only unknown is capital A. So we plug in all of our known information, and now we can solve this for the cosine of A. So observe that we are adding together 144 plus 49 to get 193. A very common mistake we see often is to now do 193 minus 168, but you don't actually have a 168 in this expression. You have 168 times the cosine of A. You can't just ignore that cosine term. You can, however, subtract 193 to the other side of the expression, and now you can divide by minus 168. So now we've solved for the cosine of A, and you can isolate angle A using an arc cosine function. So the angle A must be the arc cosine of that ratio, negative 93 over negative 168, which is about 56.4 degrees. Now we have found one of our angles. So we found that angle A was 56.4 degrees. We've marked it off in the lower left of our triangle. Now we need to find one more angle. 
we're just going to find angle B, and now we're going to use the version of the law of cosines that has that as its missing angle. B squared equals A squared plus C squared minus 2AC times the cosine of B. Plug in all of our known side lengths, distribute, and now solve for the cosine of B. Take an arc cosine to compute that this angle B at the top of the triangle is approximately 88 degrees. Now we found two angles, 56.4 and 88.0 degrees. The third angle you could find using the law of cosines, but it's extra work. Remember, if you know two angles in a triangle, you really know all three because they have to add up to 180. So C must be 180 minus the two angles that we found, which is 35.6 degrees. Now, how do you know when to use the law of sines versus the law of cosines? If you only know all the sides or two sides and an angle in between, the law of sines will not help. This is easiest to see in the situation of knowing three sides. Remember, the law of sines states that the sine of an angle divided by the side length across from it is the same value no matter which choice you make within a single triangle. But no matter which two you set against each other, you're going to have the sine of one angle and the sine of another. If you don't know any angles to begin with, that will always have two unknowns, and that doesn't really help you much. And as I said before, if you have lots of information about sides and not a lot about angles, in general, you want to go with the law of cosines. So side, 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 or two sides and the angle between, what we call side, angle, side, go with the law of cosines to start with. In some other cases, either law can be used, but there are some warnings. So let's try to solve both of these triangles. Now, taking a look at triangle A. We have two angles and the side between them. But remember, if you have two angles, you actually have all three, so we can solve for angle B quite quickly. Now that we have all three angles and we just need to find a missing side, we can use the law of sines. Because we know all of the angles, the law of sines is a good choice. So setting up the sine of 62 degrees divided by the length across from it, which is the unknown A, that must equal the sine of angle B, which we found to be 48 degrees, divided by the length across from it, which is 4. You can solve this for the unknown length A and compute it to be about 4.75. And now we do something very similar to find length C. The sine of 70 degrees divided by the length across from it, which is our unknown C, must equal the sine of angle B, which is 48 degrees divided by the length across from that, which is 4. You can solve this for the unknown length C and compute it to be approximately 5.06. So now we have all the angles and all of the sides figured out in triangle A. Let's look at triangle B. Because we know only one angle, but we do know the two sides on either side of it, we're going to use the law of cosines. So we're going to pick the version of the law of cosines that utilizes the one angle we know, which is capital A in this case. So we would use this version here, that A squared equals B squared plus C squared minus 2BC times the cosine of capital A. And observe that once you plug in the known information, of the other two side lengths and the angle 70 degrees, there's not much to do here. A squared is 67.17, meaning A is about 8.20. Now that we've found that side length A, we have all of the sides, and we have one angle 70 degrees. So we might elect to use the law of sines. The sine of B, which is an unknown angle, divided by length 6 across from it, must be equal to the sine of 70 degrees divided by 8.2, the length across from that, which we just found. This allows us to solve for the angle B to be the arc sine of 6 times the sine of 70 degrees over 8.2, which is about 43.4 degrees. And now that we know two angles, 70 degrees and 43.4, we can quickly find the missing angle to be 66.6 .6 degrees. However, you do have to be a little careful. Not every choice of sides and angles produces a valid triangle. Let's try to solve this triangle right here. Now observe we have two sides, 5 and 2, and one angle, but it's not the angle in between them. If we set up the law of sines for angle C, because we do know 60 degrees is across from angle 2, 
and we know that five is across from angle C, we can set up the law of sines and say that the sine of C over five equals the sine of 60 degrees over two, meaning the sine of C must be five times the sine of 60 degrees over two, but the sine of 60 degrees is a known quantity. You can compute this down, it's 2.16. So whatever angle C is, its sine must be 2.16. But this has no solution because the sine of an angle is always between plus or minus one. So there is no triangle in which a 60 degree angle is across from a side of length two and the other side is of length five. That just cannot possibly happen. Therefore, there is no such triangle. There's another warning to keep in mind. The law of sines might give you erroneous values for certain angles. Specifically, if you are finding the largest angle in a triangle, which must be across, by the way, from the largest side, the law of sines might give you an incorrect answer. So let's try to solve this triangle right here. 50 degrees, 30 degrees, great. 5.08, 10, and 7.78. We have lots and lots of information here. The only thing we're missing is one angle. Obviously, this missing angle is 100 degrees. All three angles must add up to 180. There's really not much to do. But what if we tried to use the law of sines? But let's try and use the law of sines anyway. And we set up that the sine of theta divided by the length across from it 10 must be equal to the sine of, let's go with 30 degrees, divided by the length across from that angle, which is 5.08. Then we can say the sine of theta must be 10 times the sine of 30 degrees over 5.08. This is true, this is totally correct. And then we would say theta should be the arc sine of this quantity, and that's 79.8 degrees. But that's not true. We already know theta must be 100 degrees. Why are we getting a different answer when we use the law of sines to find the largest angle in a triangle? So what happened in this previous example has to do with the fact that the range of the arc sine function is quadrants one or four, meaning in an actual triangle where you have positive angles, it only goes up to 90 degrees. However, sine theta equals a given value will have two solutions between 0 and 180 degrees. So if you pick a given t, a height, and say the sine of theta must be t, you're looking for y coordinates at this height. There's one of them here, but there's one of them over here. There will always be a solution in quadrant 1 and a solution in quadrant 2. But the arc sine function will only tell you the answer in quadrant 1 and ignore the possible answer in quadrant two. So if you might be looking for an angle larger than 90 degrees, arc sine is not gonna give it to you. Now a triangle can only have a single angle larger than 90 degrees, meaning it will be the largest angle, which is why we phrased this as avoid using the law of sines to find the largest angle because it might miss it entirely. So again, arc sine is gonna give you an answer between zero and 90 degrees. Now there's a general way to relate the two solutions to sine theta equals t. One of them will be arc sine, that's the one in quadrant one. The other one is 180 degrees minus that amount. If arc sine of t gives you this angle here, 180 minus the same amount gives you this angle over here. So what you could do, if you're solving for the largest angle in a triangle, you could consider two possible solutions, arc sine of a given quantity or 180 degrees minus that, if you're working in radians, pi minus that amount. In other words, the law of sines by itself might give you the incorrect value. However, bear in mind, the arc cosine function has range zero to 180 degrees. The arc cosine function will not make this mistake because arc cosine is dealing in x coordinates and from one to minus one back to one, quadrants one and two give you a full range of possible x coordinates. So if possible, if you need to find an angle and it's the largest angle in a triangle, use the law of cosines to avoid this potential problem. So always use the law of cosines to find bigger angles if you can. And there's a third warning to give you. Side-side angle, where you have two sides in a triangle and an angle that isn't in between those two sides can yield two different triangles that might both be correct. For example, 
here's a triangle where we have side length one and side length two and an angle of 25 degrees that is not in between them and that's the only information we have. So we're going to pick little a across from capital A, that's 2, little c will be 1, and capital C angle will be 25 degrees. Now we're going to show there are two possibilities for length b, and hence two triangles that could have these measurements. Let's set up the law of cosines using the only known angle, 25 degrees. Then we would see that c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab times the cosine of c. The only unknown in here is the length b. So we have 1 squared equals 2 squared plus b squared minus 2 times 2 times b times the cosine of 25 degrees. This is a quadratic equation in the unknown b. 0 equals b squared minus 4 times the cosine of 25 degrees times b plus 3. So we can solve this for b using the quadratic formula. 4 times the cosine of 25 degrees is just a number, so we have b squared minus something times b plus 3. Using the quadratic formula, we would find two possible solutions of 1.278 and 2.347. So we found two possible solutions for that missing length b. One of them might look like this, where we label b as 1.278, and then we can find angle B using the law of sines, and we would find that B is about 32.69 degrees, and then we can find A just by subtracting our two known angles from 180 and get 122.31. Okay, observe, we used the law of sines to find angle B, and it was just fine because this wasn't going to be the largest angle. Large angles are across from large sides. If we have sides 1, 2, and 1.278, the largest angle has to be across from 2. So using the law of sines to find angle B was perfectly fine. But we also could have had B as 2.347. So now observe that capital B will be the largest angle. So let's find angle A using the law of sines. Sine A over 2 must equal sine 25 degrees over 1. We can solve this for angle A using the law of sines. Because we know it is not the largest angle, this is fine, and find that A must be 57.7 degrees, and now we can find the missing angle to be 97.3 degrees. So observe two totally possible solutions with the same starting data. When you have side-side angle, you may end up with an impossible triangle, you may end up with exactly one solution, but you may also end up with two perfectly valid solutions.